The Key to the Indian by Lynn Reed Banks Chapter 17 The Old Woman A wave of absolute terror went over Omri. He was snatched from the ground and borne along. He guessed at once that it was a dog that had pounced on him. He had seen or at least heard dogs around the longhouse, and he managed to stay perfectly still. He felt instinctively that if he struggled, the great teeth would close and he would be bitten in half, and the thought was enough to paralyze him. As it was... He was held tightly. He could feel the teeth digging into him without piercing the skin, and carried at speed along the aisle. To him, as wide as a six-lane highway, between the family compartments, toward one of the center, toward one of the central fires. Halfway there, his fear-frozen brain came to his age. He was a small. He was small, rat-sized as a dog, but he was not a rat. He was a human being and must smell like one. Perhaps this was why the dog had not simply eaten him on the spot. The scent of the human would confuse it. In a flash, he remembered the old man who lived next door to them in the last London house. He'd had a dog. It was very obedient and well-trained. He used to throw things for it to chase in his garden next to theirs. When it brought the ball, or stick, or whatever it was, it would stand in front of the man who would say in stern tones, Drop it! Drop it, I say! Omri had once peered over the fence and asked him if the dog understood his words. More the tone of voice, actually, the man had replied. If you said it in French, he'd still do it. If you said it in French, he'd still do it. Can't speak a word of French, the man had said shortly, so we'll never find out. And Omri couldn't speak a word of Iroquoian. The dog holding Omri slowed down as it came near the fire. Omri felt the heat scorching his skin and instinctively twisted his head to look. To him, it looked like a blazing forest. The smell of stew was very strong now. There was a cauldron-like pot hanging from a hook over the smoldering side logs. What if he said, drop it, and the dog, and the dog dropped him into the red-hot embers? The dog stood still. It turned its head, and Omri, still firmly held between its teeth, It seemed to be looking for something, waiting for an odor, waiting for an order. Omri made up his mind. When the dog's head was turned away from the fire, Omri shouted, Drop it! Drop it now! For a split second, the teeth tightened, and Omri thought his last moment had come. But then, quite gently, the dog bent its head and laid Omri on the ground. He lay there, his head nearly bursting out of his, his heart nearly bursting out of his ribs. There was slobber all over his torso, and bruises where the teeth had been. He felt himself gingerly while the dog sniffed at him, but somehow respectfully now. It's a dog, thought Omri. That's all it is, just a stupid old dog. He got up slowly, his eyes on the dog. He noticed it was white all over, and of a breed he had never seen before. It backed away, whining softly. Get lost! Omri shouted commandingly. Push off! Scram! The dog's hair suddenly bristled and Omri thought he had made the worst mistake of his life, but then it turned, tail between legs, and slithered under the nearest corn husk, curtain yelping with fear. Omri stood near the fire, dry mouthed, shaking, and tried to recover himself. He knew he should get back straight away to Little Bear's cubicle, but he didn't know which one it was, and for him it was quite a long walk, a walk fraught with danger all the way. Besides, the smell of stew and the warmth of the fire held him as long as he felt weak from his scare. Just then, he became aware of a movement. He turned his head sharply and saw that someone was watching him. She was sitting right at the other side of the fire, an old, old woman. He hadn't seen her before, because part of the fire, with its drifting smoke, was between them, and she was quite still, a dark, hunched figure, with a wooden ladle in one hand and a bowl in the other, just watching him through the smoke. She wasn't so much staring as peering at him through the smoke with narrowed eyes, a long time seemed to pass, and she rose slowly and hobbled around the fire to where he was standing. She crouched down again. Her knees beneath their ancient buckskin skirt rose on either side of him like the hill, like hills. He gazed up into a face that reminded him of the cliffs on the shore of, Eng of the English Channel near his home. Reddish sandstone eroded by rain into long downward cre creases. This face was like wind carving was like a wind carving on that cliff, wrinkled beyond anything he had ever seen. She looked about a hundred and twenty years old, 
Her eyes were swollen and inflamed. Omri saw that she couldn't make him out properly because she kept turning her head this way and that. And she was smiling an ancient smile. She put the bowl down, and a palsied hand groped for him. Before he could think what to do, she had picked him up. She lifted him level with her face and examined him. She turned him this way and that and felt him with her bony fingers. She was smiling and shaking her head wonderingly. She spoke to him. Of course, he didn't answer. Her face registered impatience. Suddenly, her shaking hand lost its hold, and she found him dangling by one leg. He let out a yell. She swung him right way up again, and again she asked him a question. He shrugged, the big neck, sh the big neck shrinking shrug his dad did sometimes. Using his hands, the old woman grinned crazily. She had one huge tooth the size of a tombstone. Her face was so full of childlike pleasure, he felt emboldened somehow. He pointed to his mouth. She nodded, grinning, and put him on her lap, which was like a vast hammock. She reached up and scooped something out of the pot with a ladle and brought it down to him. The ladle was a small murky lake full of islands. The liquid was gravy. The islands were lumps of meat and vegetables. It was steaming hot. The old woman let out a cackle, and with, a heap, and with, heap, and with heat-proof finger and thumb, she broke off a pinch of meat and blew on it. Then she dumped it into Omri's arms. He yelled again. It was like having half a barbecued pig to hold. It was burning his arms and smearing them all over with grease and gravy. But this was bearable next to his hunger. The smell pulled his teeth to the meat like a magnet, and he took a bite. It was marvelous. He gnawed on the long fibers of the meat, and the juices spilled into his eager mouth. He tore at it until he could eat no more, while the old woman made little gurgling noises of amusement. She took the last of it away from him and ate it herself. She wiped her fingers on the ground, and the hills and the earth floor sank away as she levered herself upright, still holding Omri tightly. She turned. She was going to take him off to her own compartment. Omri knew it and felt almost as fearful as when he had been in the power of the dog. But suddenly, right in front of him, he saw a familiar necklace. He strained to look upward. Yes, it was Little Bear standing in close in front of the woman. He spoke to her respectfully but strongly. He put one hand it was within reach of he put out his hand, it was within reach of Omri. There was a pause. He felt the old woman's claw like fingers clenching him possessively possessively. He gasped. He felt the breath being squeezed out of him. Little Bear laid his hand on the old woman as he spoke again very gently. He was asking her to give Omri up. The squeezing clutch relaxed, and with a reluctance Omri could sense she handed him over. The relief was overwhelming. He instantly felt safe again. He almost kissed Little Bear's hand as once again it encircled his waist. Little Bear went striding down the aisle, and in a few moments Omri felt the rustling curtain brush against his face, and they were back in the compartment. Little Bear then held Omri up in front of him and proceeded to give him the bollocking of all time. You! You stay with Father! Stay where you are safe! You are boy, and little bear is man. But when in you, but when in you world he stays, does not run along looking for danger. If you die, little bear will cry, bright stars cry, father cry, and how your father will help our tribe if he cries over your body. Stupid, stupid. I was hungry, said, said Omri sulkily. Little bear looked taken aback. No one give food? No. Little bear grunted thoughtfully and set him down next to his father, who looked white-faced and torn between anger and relief. "'Where the hell did you go?' he muttered. "'Omri, what happened to you? You are covered with bruises.' "'A dog picked me up.' Omri's father turned a shade paler, if possible, and simply stared at him in horror. He looked almost ill. He put his arms around Omri and held him for a moment. "'Don't! Don't!' he muttered into his ear. Omri understood what he couldn't say. "'I won't, Dad. I'm sorry.' They sat down among the hide hills together in silence. After a few minutes, Bright Stars came through the curtain with a bowl in her hand and laid it before them. It was full of, some st of the same stew. Omri's father perked up a bit. Hey, smell that, he said rather weakly. Omri was feeling terrible about having frightened him and tried to get over it with a joke. I'm an Indian stew, he sang. Try it, Dad, it's good. But his dad was more cautious. What is this meat? He asked Bright Stars. She smiled and touched some decorations on her dress. 
Does she mean it's deer? No, said his dad. I'm afraid not. Those are quills. This must be porcupine meat. Omri swallowed. Well, it's really good anyway. How do you know? A crazy old woman gave me some. Whoosh! He left his stomach, full of the oily meat far behind him as Little Bear snatched him up again. It was like going up in an elevator at the rate of twenty floors a second. Bad words, roared Little Bear, shaking him fiercely. You do not call a woman crazy. She is eldest clan mother, full of wisdom, full of years. You show her respect, or I bring dog and drop no tears when he eats you. Omri tried to hold the contents of his stomach down, but it was no use. The shaking was the last straw, and he threw up violently. This brought Little Bear out of his anger, if only because he had thrust Omri hastily away. There was a pause, and then he burst out laughing. Now you need more food. Fill empty stomach. Soon no more food for tribe, he said. Omri uttered a groan and wiped his mouth, thinking irresistible.